I hope you all had a, a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, and that you were all well fed. Uh, I asked for the back pews camp to to be blocked off because we'll be doing some stuff here, and that's why I, I asked. I mean, I'm pushing you guys forward, but still, you don't want to sit that close. Um, <laughs> let me begin with prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, acceptable to you, O Lord my rock, my Lord, my Redeemer. Amen. So it used to be that most stores were closed on Thanksgiving, but a while ago they started opening Thanksgiving night. Um, and so Thanksgiving now marks the beginning of a consumer tidal wave online and in, in, in person. From th Thursday's Thanksgiving to Black Friday to Cyber Monday tomorrow, Americans are searching the internet and flooding the stores for deals. It is estimated that over these five days, Americans will spend $996 billion. That's almost a trillion dollars. Stores and our economy depend on it. And these five days represent 17% of all of our spending this year. Thanksgiving and this week usher in the time of American consumption. This is the time we are being formed by as we start looking towards Christmas, December 25th. This is the calendar we are being shaped by. It's the time we are inhabiting now. Um, and it forms us. And I would argue it malforms us. So this morning, I want to help all of us understand what time it is. All right, this, is a, this is a lecture on telling time. Not that long ago, in the Methodist tradition, and in the Anglican and other traditions, the time between All Saints, which was about three weeks ago, and the Sunday that's coming up, Advent Sunday, next Sunday, that period of time was called Kingdom Tide. Go ahead and say, Kingdom Tide. Kingdom Tide. Did any of you guys ever hear about Kingdom Tide? It's new to me because I, mean, I wasn't shaped by it, but I'm a historian as well, so I look these things up and I like to present them so that we know these things. Now, Kingdom Tide was a time in the church calendar set aside to acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and King. And it developed after World War I, uh, the ravages of that war, and the way in which different nations were warring against each other. And so the time that we find ourselves now, and some still observe this time, uh, is called Kingdom Tide. And that is very appropriate, especially for us in the USA since our elections always take place in November. And national politics usually dominate our formation and our attention. Elections across the world are reaching surprising results. And people in democracies are searching for change and putting their faith in different candidates, different parties. National politics reigns. But kingdom tides meant to show us a different way. Today uh, is Christ the King Sunday. And it's in this time of kingdom tide. And many churches across uh, the U.S. and the world still celebrate Christ the King Sunday. They're contemplating, we're contemplating, the significance of God's reign in Jesus Christ. And for the past few weeks, and Sundays in American churches, messages about the wars um, of Israel and Hamas, the sacrifice of veterans, and other national political topics have dominated the church's agenda. And Kingdom Tide has been neglected, and the church's politics has been confused with the world's. But but knowledge of Kingdom Tide, the church time that we are in, I believe can help us. How we are timed is important. It's important that we think deeply 
about how Christ is our King, especially amongst our thoughts on American politics, global politics, and especially when we, ha- we are hearing more and more about the wars in Israel and Palestine, Ukraine and Russia. Now, the confession, Jesus is Lord, is at the heart of the church. Paul tells us in Romans, if you confess with your mouth, what? Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus is Lord. In our worship and confession, we practice a very clear politics. The church has a king. To confess Jesus as Lord is to claim that the church is political. It's a politics not of this world, which is to remind us and to say that the national party party politics of the United States is not what we're talking about. Rather, the church in its allegiance to its Lord is a witness to the kingdom of heaven and his reign here on earth. The church is a political body, and the worship of Jesus as Lord is the central expression of our allegiance to that kingdom. Our worship showing up here, singing Rejoice Christ the Lord, uh, Camille's prayer, we are participating in politics. The church is political. Christ is our king. Now, the reading for Christ the King Sunday uh, includes Ezekiel 34 which uh, we heard read this morning. Uh, And so when pastor asked me to preach, I asked if I could preach on this passage. Now, many years ago, uh, my wife and I and my family and others, uh, we started a little church plant in Southern California. And and there, for the kids uh, part of church, we did something called godly play. Now, godly play is a type of curriculum that's in some ways based on Montessori, it, it's an updated flannel graph type of curriculum, right? And we remember flannel graphs, yeah? Uh, so occasionally on, on one or two Sundays during the month, we'd have everyone together in this church plant, and we would do godly play for, for all of us, for adults and kids. And what we quickly f- discovered is that adults were really drawn in to this Sunday school lesson uh, in some ways, they were more captivated, captivated by it than the kids. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to, I'm going to walk us through Ezekiel 34 with, with some of my toys. Right? And in order for that to work, you really need to participate and kind of put yourself back in that place of kind of wondering uh, like you would have wondered when you were in elementary school. All right? So you're going to have to kind of be engaged like you're back in Sunday school. And that, so then that means what I'm going to do, I'm also going to offer anyone who wants to, to come sit up closer. Now, probably, I know none of you are going to do that. <laughs> but I'm still going to offer that for you. Thank you, Rick. Rick is going to do it. Thank you, Rick. Right? So you can come up front and you can see a little bit better of what I'm doing. This is Sunday school. It's okay to move around. Uh, it's even all right to potentially talk back. So this is a slow, kind of methodical, (laughs) that's the way you sit on the floor, Uh, a slow, methodical telling of the story. So I hope this will help us think more biblically about our politics uh, in our hungry and violent world. So are you ready? Yeah. Let's begin. Now, the book of Ezekiel begins in Babylon. This is Babylon. We just need a little piece of it to help us tell the story. Babylon was hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. And in Babylon, God's people were exiled. And Ezekiel, this is Ezekiel, a priest, was exiled as well. And he was by the river Chebar in Babylon. 
Now, the first chapter of Ezekiel, the first chapter of Ezekiel tells of an amazing and wonderful visitation of God to Ezekiel. And so Ezekiel is here by the river in Babylon, and in the sky, he looks in the sky and he sees cherubim. (laughs) Cherubim with different faces of eagles and bulls. Some of these guys like to fall down. And the wind would kind of blow from their wings on him. He also saw these wheels within wheels that also approached him. And as he was being visited and he saw these things, he looked above the wings and the wheels and he saw a dome, a crystal blue dome. And as he looked through the dome, he saw a throne and a person upon it, seated upon the throne. And behind the throne was a rainbow, radiant light. Ezekiel was being visited by God on his chariot throne. God had come from Israel Israel from Jerusalem and visited his exiles in Babylon where they had no king. Christ the king, God the king, came to them on his throne. And Ezekiel is overwhelmed and he falls and worships. This is the first chapter. And from this point on in the book of Ezekiel, God gives visions and tasks to Ezekiel which demonstrate the faithlessness of Israel. And he asks Ezekiel to prophesy the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem. This fills the first 24 chapters of the book of Ezekiel. These 24 chapters reveal the idolatry of Israel and the ways they had rejected God as their Lord. From chapters 25 to 32, God's disappointment with Israel is broadened to seven other nations. God was displeased with Israel, but he was also displeased with these nations. And these nations surrounded Israel and were Israel's traditional enemies. This is the land of Israel. Now we just need a little piece of it to help us tell the story. All right. Now God tells Ezekiel to set his face toward the Ammonites. To set his face toward the Ammonites and to prophesy against them. This is the Ammonite king. Now, Ammon is in the region, the modern-day region of Syria and Jordan. And then God tells Ezekiel to set his face towards the Moabites. And this is the king of Moab. And Moab is in the region of modern-day Jordan. Again, God tells Ezekiel to set his face against the Edomites. And this is the king of Edom. And to prophesy against them. And the Edomites are in the region also of Jordan and some of Saudi Arabia. Then God asks Ezekiel to set his face towards the Philistines. And this is the king of the Philistines. And this is in the modern region of Gaza. 
Again, God commands Ezekiel to now set his face to the king of Tyre. This is the king of Tyre. And the king of Tyre resided in the region of Lebanon. And then to the king of Sidon, which is also in the region of Lebanon. And then lastly, for four chapters, God tells Ezekiel to set his face against the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Each of these nations, each of these kings with their weapons, had standing armies, and Israel was surrounded. Now, God is not pleased with these nations as much as he is not pleased also with Israel. To help tell this story further, I need to go back in time a little bit further as well, to the time of the judges, to the time when Israel had no king but God. It was a time when God raised up leaders like Deborah and Gideon. Over that time, over that time, Israel was overcome with fear. It was it feared its neighbors. And so they asked Samuel. There's Samuel. They asked Samuel to give them a king. Because they were impatient with God as their king. Now this displeased Samuel. And so he prayed. And God said to him, Listen to the voice of the people and in all that, in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, they've rejected me. They've rejected me from being king over them. But solemnly warn them and show them the ways the king will reign over them. So Samuel warns them about how the king will treat them, taxing them and keeping an army, inevitably leading to violence in and outside of Israel's borders. And he anoints the king. Now Israel wanted to be like all the other nations who had a king. And now Israel had a king. So Samuel anoints Saul, then David, and then there's Solomon. And more kings, and more kings come. Some good, and some not so good. Most of them bad, and all of them violent. These kings did not attend to the worship of God or the care of the poor. And these kings became fat and rich. People went hungry, were left sick, and there was violence. Israel had become just like all the other nations. And so God exiled them from the land, and now they would find themselves in Babylon without a king. Now it's in this context that God comes to Ezekiel. It is in this context of judgment against the kings of opulence and violence, the shepherds who have not fed the sheep, that God says he will be their good shepherd, that he will be their king. So this finally gets us to chapter 34. It's a long build-up. The good shepherd, Jesus. In chapter 34, what we heard read was that God says, Ah, you shepherds, all you shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves, 
with their wool. But you do not feed the sheep. And thus says the Lord God, I'm against the shepherds. And I will demand my sheep at their hand and put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths so that they may not be food for them. God's rule is the rule of the good shepherd. And that rule is a rule that will seek out the lost, the weak, the sick, the infirmed, and bring them back. And he will feed the hungry, and he will bind up the injured, and will strengthen the weak. But the fat and strong he will destroy. He says that he will feed them with justice. God's rule, God's rule, the rule of the good shepherd, is a rule of shalom, of peace. It is a rule that remembers the hungry and the vulnerable. And it is a rule revealed to us in Jesus Christ. In chapter 10 of the Gospel of John, Jesus says that he is the good shepherd. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He tells us that the sheep will follow him because they will recognize his voice. And they will listen to his voice. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the, king's, is the king of the church. And his politics, his politics are different. The politics of Christ the king are different than the politics of the world. So I wonder, I invite you to continue to wonder, what do you wonder about in the telling of this story on Christ the King Sunday? I wonder if we can understand God's reign as a shepherd for us today. I wonder, what do you wonder about? We're in... uh, Kingdom Tide, right? Kingdom Tide. This is Christ the King Sunday. Acknowledging Christ as our King is political. And it has political consequences. And it should. Right? Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed King. And because of that, he was killed. At the top of the cross, in three languages, it said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The politics of Jesus leads to a cross. The politics of the church, therefore, is cruciform. It's got, it has consequences. And that is why the good shepherd, who is king, bears the cross and not the sword. Not munitions. The power of Christ is not in wealth. It's not in weapons. But the power of Christ is to lay down his life in love for the forgiveness and reconciliation of the world. Within American democracy, it is not rare for Christians to say that Jesus is Lord in my personal opinion. Jesus is Lord in my personal opinion. Right? To claim Jesus as Lord as a personal opinion is to think that lordship, kingship, is a consumer choice. One of many options available to us on Black Friday or Cyber Monday that we are free to choose. But that statement, the statement that Jesus is Lord, is either true or it's not. And we sang it. We confess it. If we think it is a personal opinion, it reveals that we believe there are many lords for people to choose from, many things you can align yourself to, and that Jesus is just one of many personal wellness programs that we can choose so that we might feel good about ourselves while we try to accumulate wealth, security, and freedom. 
In other words, be a good American, a faithful American consumer. For the church to take his lordship seriously is to understand that confessing Jesus as Lord is dangerous. It's dangerous because it is a stance against the violent powers of this world, the militaries of this world, of the USA, Israel, Hamas, and more. The politics of the Good Shepherd is different. It's radical. It's a politics that loves one's enemy, which means you won't kill them. For the church to take his lordship seriously is to understand that confessing Jesus as Lord is also sacrificial. Because it is a stance against the wealthy of this world who steal and hoard. The politics of the good shepherd is different. It is a politics that feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, visits the incarcerated, and lays itself down for peace. Not for wealth, not for safety and security, not for revenge and not for control. It's a different politics. To live under his rule as our king requires obedience. Jesus commands us to love God and our neighbor, to love our enemies, to care for the poor, to feed the hungry, to proclaim the good news of his reign to all. This is the good work we are called to do as his people under his rule. This is the politics of his reign. Now that's hard work because we have many competing allegiances, right? That's hard work. When the church takes political sides in partisan politics and international politics, it often believes the lie that money and power is what will affect change. And in the process, the church and Christians begin to look like all the other nations. And then the church engages in and is complicit with the accumulation of wealth and the violence of the nations to keep us rich. Hence, what is necessary for the church to follow the Lord in the USA is a new political imagination. An imagination that believes that the gospel of Jesus is good news and the power of God. That we really believe it. That he reigns in the face of all that we see. That Christ is still Lord. This political imagination reminds us that Jesus is Lord and we are not. And that means we must be patient. It requires patience. When you're not God, when you're, not, when you're just a disciple, you're trusting the Lord. A, a professor, Stanley Harawas, says this about patience. He said, patience is not only the form of peace, but patience is the power made present through the works of mercy. He says, too often I fear Christians say they want justice, but what they want is the power of worldly kings. We do so because we assume it is only by having such power that we are able to do some good or to force some order on a violent world. But what it means for Jesus to be Lord, for Jesus to be king, is that we have all the time in the world to rule through caring for the hungry. A people who have learned to live patiently offer hope to a world that believes there is no alternative to violence. A people who have learned to live patiently offer hope to a world that believes there is no alternative to violence. The reign of the Good Shepherd is good news. It is the gospel the church believes must be lived and proclaimed. Now what if we told our neighbors and nations and other nations about it? What if we lived obediently under it? 
What would our witness be? I wonder. Today is Christ the King Sunday. So think deeper with me. It's an invitation to think deeper with me about what it means to be the church under his lordship. We need to think deeper. I want to close with another important date on the Christian calendar. Uh, Jade, if you put up that icon. Um, Every November 11th is uh, the feast day of St. Martin of Tours. It's also uh, Veterans Day. Now, St. Martin uh, lived in the 4th century. He was a soldier. Uh, And here you see him on his, his horse in this icon. Now, as a soldier, uh, he, he was converted and he was preparing for his baptism. And he came upon a poor man who was naked. And you can see the, the, the figure on the right there. And he's cold. And St. Martin sees other people passing him by. And St. Martin stops uh, next to the man And seeing that he's naked, he cuts half of his cloak off and he covers him. Uh, He gets teased about this because he looks silly with his new kind of like this this new fashion, this half half cape thing. But then he goes to bed that night and in a dream, it's revealed to him that the man was Jesus. He was naked and he clothed him. St. Martin, soon after getting baptized, right I mean after that, realized that he could no longer be a soldier. He said, I'm a soldier of Christ. I'm not permitted to fight. St. Martin had a new political imagination. He was under the rule of the good shepherd that feeds the hungry and clothes the naked, puts down his weapons, and lays down his life for his Lord. What time is it? Well, tomorrow's Cyber Monday, and Tuesday's Giving Tuesday, and we have, we're making lists for things to buy, and we have, to, we, have, we have a deadline for all the Christmas presents, right? We're being timed. Um, what does it mean to pay attention to the church's time? How might the reign of Jesus, the shepherd king, who clothes the naked and feeds the hungry, shape this season of American politics and spending. It's a plug for the giving trees. <laughs> right? For all that the church is doing and the way in which Camille leads us. Right? Next week is the beginning of Advent. And Advent is the time when we are called to repent and prepare for the King's coming. Right? King, king's coming on Christmas, but also, and maybe especially, his second coming as judge. It's a time that can help us be faithful to the reign of Jesus if we use the time well, if we think deeper about the time. Jesus the King is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. He speaks and his sheep hear his voice and follow. Jesus is our shepherd king, and he feeds us. Do you hear him? If you hear him, then let us gather around his table and be fed well with his presence for the reconciliation and healing of the world. Let's give him thanks. Let us pray. It is our duty and our joy to thank and praise you, God of heaven and earth. For you are our shepherd, who called Abraham by name, gathered a people under Moses, fed your flock in the wilderness, and led them out of Egypt and Babylon to take refuge in your sheepfold. 
In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus to be our shepherd king, leading us beside still waters, delivering us from the valley of the shadow of death, and restoring our souls. Abundant God, you bestow upon your people the riches of your glorious inheritance and the immeasurable greatness of your power. You send upon your disciples the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And so we ask, Lord, that you send now that same spirit to breathe upon your church and make it resound with your praise. And we ask that you sanctify this bread and this cup, that they may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who at supper with his disciples took bread, gave you thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. God of glory, You sent Jesus to be our prophet, priest, and king, and you show us his face. You show us his face in the face of those on whom the world turns its back. As the tempted Christ was hungry in the wilderness, make yourself known to all who search for food. As the crucified Christ was thirsty hanging on the tree, reveal your love among those who lack clean water. As the infant Christ was a stranger in Egypt, manifest your presence through any who are pilgrims from afar. As the newborn Christ was naked in the manger, live in all who experience shame and exposure. As Christ in his passion was sick to the heart in Gethsemane, declare your grace among those who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. And as Christ under judgment was a prisoner under Pontius Pilate, be with all who are incarcerated by folly, injustice, or fear. Lord, Shepherd King, renew your church by making it resemble Jesus, our crucified King, our Savior, Lord, and Friend, with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Now we are bold to pray together the prayer that your son, the king, has given us. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.